recorded. All right. All right, well, welcome everyone. We'll start with the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Did anyone bring any of their three by five cards back with questions? No? No? Oh. All right. If you have questions, it would be wonderful. I don't, you know, I don't need them, but it, I just try every way I can to get questions. So it's all right. Um, as as we get started tonight, I wanted to uh, I want to thank Brian, and I want to thank him on the screen because I want to correct it on the screen. Uh, last week we were talking about Jesus, and as I think everyone knows, and what I was trying to convey again is Jesus was fully human and fully divine. But there's a debate. If you go online, you get a debate. There are people who disagree, but I checked with Father um, Megida, and he said exactly what you said, which is cr true. And this is the explanation of, did Jesus have a human nature? He's fully human and fully divine. So you say, he's fully human. He must have a human nature to be fully human. That's what it sounds like. And that's what many people speculate. But uh, the official teaching, this is one of the ways it was explained. Christ could be both a human person and a divine person in the sense of his human person being a partaker in a divine person. In short, the answer is no, he didn't have both. He wasn't, he didn't have both two, a human nature and a divine, I mean, human it's person. It's not, he, yeah. he didn't have a human, he wasn't a human person and a divine person. That's what he's saying. The argument is he had both. He said in Christ, that person is God. And a divine person cannot change into a divine human mix. That's what, the official father said it would be it would be dualistic mm -hmm. if he had both. So he's a human, fully human and fully divine, but he's this second person of the Trinity, not he didn't therefore have a human person. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, it's a theolo theological question. But I appreciate you telling me that. Yeah, well, so okay. quick summary of this it's one person in two natures. Yes. So this person is divine, his nature, nature is human, 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 human and divine. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to do it. But I appreciate it. And people do. Tell me, welcome. Are y'all new? To, obviously, yeah. you're coming for the first time tonight. Yeah. Well, that's the wrong place. <laughs> that's for the daily. Yeah, that, okay. You can borrow. Okay. She I can borrow. borrow. I know she's borrowing. I'm going to give you uh, that information. Can I uh, get you? Why don't we do this? I'm going with the class in when it's over. I'll give you all the good work. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. But that, but I always appreciate, it. you know, that sometimes you go so fast you don't think, and other times things are very theological. Things are still being debated. It's it's it's, it's interesting, but that was a very important point because I had always talked about fully human and fully divine, but I've really never talked much about the natures, and that's why I came out wrong. But I'm very grateful for Brian to saying clarifying that. So next week he'll be teaching the course, and I'll be sitting there, and. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really agree. All right, we're going to look at the first chapter tonight. And I want to start off by, by mentioning um, the first several classes, in my opinion, are the most difficult and challenging because we're dealing basically with the fundamentals of philosophy. And we talked about the definition before, you know, the philosophy is a study of, of beings and things. Where, where theology is the study of God. And the way the church sees theology as standing on the shoulders of philosophy. So we need philosophy, and then we need to look at how we take that philosophy and stand on it. Now, there is no principal Catholic philosophy. The church takes any philosophy that uses the truth that expands on what the theology explains but there's no specific Catholic theology, although many people would say 
it was Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was a great philosopher, but before him was uh, was um, Augustine. And the funny thing about Augustine is that he was desperately trying to find what was really true, and he was in a lot of really bad things. He was a dualist. Um, he actually had a child out of wedlock. He, he didn't marry the, the, the young girl. They had a child. His mother's Saint Monica prayed for him for 35 years to become a Christian. And he she eventually was successful. He he ran off and ran away from, from her when he was in North Africa and ended up in Rome. And then she found out. So she went to Rome, then he went to Milan. I think it was Milan. And he was there and a and a bishop became influence influential in his life and he came into the church as a as an adult and then he became the great philosopher theologian of the early church from about the fourth century and his writings basically gave us a way to study the theology the teaching of the church in a systematic way and they basically prevailed for about 700 years now it's hard for us americans who think we're really old at 250 years to think or 245 to think of something like 700 years but Aquinas came along and he did something that was extraordinarily useful. Is he went back and got some of the great Greek philosophers, Aristotle, and he took that philosophy and put it into theology. And he basically was the way we taught the faith for the next 700 years. And the textbooks that we use in our CCD program basically are structured around Thomistic philosophy. And it's a very wonderful way to teach the faith. But the problem is when we talk about things that are 700 years old, they don't have the same meaning as they do today. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things he describes in, in the understanding of the Eucharist, which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which comes about at the mass. Um, he said that it's the, the terminology he used is trans substantiation, which means the substance substantiation is changed. But it, and he said the accidents, which are the things that make the, the things we see and, and feel stay, uh, don't change. They, they look the same. So the Eucharist looks like bread, tastes like bread. It's white, it's made, made from wheat, but it's changed. The substance has changed. Well, the reason that's difficulty is if you ask a young person today, what's an accident? They say a car crash. And if you ask a young person today, what's a substance? They say drug abuse. So when you're using terms that are 700 years old, they have totally different meanings. So we really have to go back and re-educate young people and how we use the words that we use in our teaching. Now, as a coincidence, a very dear friend of mine was a priest, a brilliant, brilliant priest, had a doctorate in ancient history before he became a priest. Um, believed that St. John Paul II, St. Pope, Pope St. John Paul II, was probably the next in the line of those two. Someday, looking back 200 years from now, we'll say Augustine, Aquinas, John Paul II. Because his body of work, he wrote an average of 40 pages of writing per day of every day of his pontificate. He was an incredibly gifted and he used a different philosophical structure, but he wanted to make the teaching of the faith more experiential, more like the way we teach children. And he changed the way in a thing called the theology of the body. And it's several hundred pages long, very philosophical in nature. And the way he presented it to the church is every Wednesday when he had an audience in Rome, every Wednesday he was present in Rome for five years, he gave a 20 minute portion of that philosophy. It's amazing. But people have put it together in a book and you can read it, but it's called Theology of the Body. And his, his concept was that everything we do, basically, because we are body and soul, our soul's what makes us unique, but our bodies are what we see and we communicate through our bodies. I'm moving my hands. I'm not Italian, but I, I like to talk with my hands. But we do everything from a body perspective. So he was talking about the significance and the importance and the beauty of the, of the human body 
as a means of expressing the person. So it was, it's really marvelous. But going with that sort of background, I want to start with this idea of how we start in a way with philosophy. One of the, what I hope in this class, if you have questions, you can interrupt me at any time. There's something you want to know about, some area that we're talking about or something, just, just raise your hand. I'd be happy. I'd much rather ask, answer questions than give a lecture. Because, but if I ask you right now, does anybody have a question? Nobody will have a question. So rather than sit here and look at me for 50 minutes, I will give a presentation. That's just the way it works out. So, But please ask, ask questions. So let's look at, at this, this first chapter. And we're dealing with the Nicene Creed. I want to go back in a few minutes and give you how we got the Nicene Creed and how that differs from the Apostles' Creed. Um, the first section of the Nicene Creed deals with God the Father. The, the next section will deal with Jesus Christ as Son. The third section will deal with the Holy Spirit. And then it will go into the church and other aspects of it. The Nicene Creed is the creed we profess every Sunday at Mass. It's the official creed of the church. Now, creeds came about over time to basically summarize the faith, simplify it so that we can recite it and remember. So the, the first creed that's still used in the church, but not in the formal sense that we do at Mass, is called the Apostles' Creed. And there's 12 articles in the Apostles' Creed, which we'll look at more detail later. But they were, we believe, came from the apostles in the first century. But if you look at the Nicene Creed, and I have a handout that shows them side by side, you can see how the Nicene Creed was just expanded. The same teachings that are in the Apostles' Creed are contained in the Nicene Creed. So both of them are going to start out with this idea that we are professing. And this is, this is each individual is professing this each week as your and our faith expression. So we say, I believe in one God, and we say he's the Father Almighty is one of his attributes. He's the maker or creator of both the heaven and the earth, and he created all things visible and invisible. So we're going to look at that as it's expressed in chapter one, which deals with this question, what is the purpose of man's existence? Why am I here? Those are the philosophical questions we ask. What must I do? Um, who's going to tell me the answers to these questions? So that's what we want to look at. So first of all, I wanted to start back, and this is my my ideas. This is not necessarily anything in the book, but I think one of the most important things that primitive man dealt with from the beginning was fertility. Fertility for having children and fertility for his animals to produce other animals and fertility for his crops to produce more crops. So fertility was a very important concept, if you will, something to be prayed about by the primitive man. And because of that, he wasn't exactly sure where it all came from. So the primitive man basically had many gods. They were polytheists, meaning multiple theism is God, M many gods. So he would worship many gods. If he thought, gee, you know, if I plant, a, if I plant a, a, an apple tree near the river, I get more apples than if I plant the apple tree in the middle of this less arid and this more arid land. So maybe it's the river is the God that feeds my tree. So he would worship the river. And this is what was going on all throughout ancient history is basically man had a multitude of different gods to worship. Now, how does primitive man, if you will, believe that he could satisfy a particular God? What would he have to do to make that God be happy with him? So most attribute this to the beginning of animal sacrifices. So I'm a shepherd and I have sheep and hopefully I'm praying for fertility, fertility so that the, the sheep will have more sheep. And I'm praying that I, my, my crop will, my flock will stay healthy and that sort of thing. So if I want to appease a God, if I wanted to appease the river, that's now my God. What would I do? Well, I would take one of my sheep, probably a baby, a lamb, and I would offer it in sacrifice. I would give it to the God. Now, how would you give something to something that's inanimate? 
you'd burn it up. You would put a fire and you would say to the river, I'm going to offer you this lamb in in thanksgiving, in prayer, in, in hope. You'll give me more fertility. And I'm going to build a fire and I'm going to put the, the lamb on the fire. And as the lamb is burned up and the smoke rises, that's my way of giving it to you. And I can't get it back. It's, it is a complete gift. And it was expensive. A lamb was very expensive to, to shepherds. Because if you lost the wrong lamb, you may never have another lamb because that may be the only one that would produce other. So there's a real danger in that. But this was the idea that primitive man always wanted to satisfy the gods. So animal sacrifice was quite common. In some cultures, at some different times, in history, even during the period of the Jewish people, people offered humans in sacrifice. And we know the Mayas did, we, the, whatever, there's several tribes around the world that would offer children to, to their gods in hope that they would be satisfied. So animal sacrifice, human sacrifice was something that had been around for thousands of years. Now, just to give you an idea, because we know Israel eventually got to Egypt, <laughs> Egypt had about 8,700 different gods. So if you're a polytheist, you can sort of pick and choose or you can you can try to figure out which of the most important ones or the most important ones, the ones that the Pharaoh does or, or maybe the ones that you're, the town you're living in are, are especially close to or maybe your family ones. And so there's always this mix of gods that people were worshiping to. Approximately 64 Egyptian gods were part of a major part of Egyptian life. And um, in the mid 400s, they recorded over 2000 deities that were being worshiped in Egypt. I just imagine if you, if, if you had to keep up with 2000 gods. So almost every village in Egypt had their own God. Every Pharaoh had his own God and, and they were constantly changing. And why am I telling you all this? Uh, because let me, Jump this over. I thought that's where I wanted, but I want this first, then I'll come back to that. Because at the time in history, about 1850 years before Christ, we're talking about almost 4,000 years ago, the descendants of Noah after the flood were walking the face of the earth. And one of them was named Abram. He was living down in a town called Ur, which is down in what's modern Saudi Arabia, down in the very base of Saudi Arabia. And God called him to go with his family up to a town in Turkey, to today, Turkey. And there he called him to a covenant. And this is where everything changes for our ancestors, the Hebrew people, the ancestors of Christ. We're descendants of Christ. He was a follower and descendant of Abraham, as are we. But Abraham was called by God, and Abraham was offered by God a covenant. Now, it's interesting. We had time to ask questions. but A contract is an agreement for goods and services for a payment. So maybe, maybe one of you or maybe one of you when you are, are, may still be babysitting. You you may make a contract. You would go to a person's house. They say, we'll pay you so much an hour for you to take care of our children while we go and do something that we need to get done. So that's a contract. Or you may, guys used to mow lawns. Today, there's lawn services for everything. But when I grew up, boys, young boys would go and mow, mow, mow people's lawn. And they'd say, okay, I will mow this lawn, trim the edges for this amount of money, and the agreement would be, and I'll pay you that amount of money when you've mowed the lawn. That's a contract. Contracts can be written. Contracts can be broken. Contracts can be changed. But a covenant is a promise by two entities until one of the entities dies. So Abraham came to, I mean, God came to Abraham and said, I want to make a covenant with you and all your descendants. And the catch is, you have to worship me as the one and only true God. No more polytheism. It's now called monotheism. So the Jewish people are descendants of this one 
man. His name was Abram. When he agreed to the covenant, God changed his name to Abraham. He was married to a woman named Sarai, who was barren, had no children. And he changed her name to Sarah. So Abraham and Sarah, the parents of the Hebrew people. And he promised a son to Abraham. He was old. He was in his 80s. His wife was in her 70s. They weren't expecting to have children. So they didn't believe that they would that God would give Sarah a child. So what do you think they did? Well, Sarah had a maid and she was Egyptian. She was young. She was their servant. So Sarah says to Abraham, if you have relations with her, my maid, then that's how God will give us a child. And that happened. And they had a and they had a child. And God told Abraham shortly thereafter, no, that's that's not what I said. I said, I will give Sarah a son for you. And sure enough, several months later, Sarah had a son, um, Isaac. And Isaac was the only son of Abraham that was part of the promise and the covenant. Now, coincidentally, the other son was named Ishmael. And Ishmael became the father of all the Arabian tribes. So all of the Middle Eastern tribes of, of that era back at the time of him are the descendants of that tribe. And they've been at war with the descendants of Israel ever since. It's just ironic that the history of the world developed in that way. But Abraham and Isaac, his first son, was the beginning of that. Now, Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Long story. They end up having 12 sons because he married four different women, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. All this is part of the history of what's going on. So the covenant is still, in in a way, uh, active, but because the descendants of Abraham, we are really descendants of Abraham, spiritually. We're not physically, but Spiritually, we're the sins of Abraham. So anyway, that's how that's how God communicated this. And he promised Abraham, God promised Abraham three things. He said, if you will obey and worship only me, I will give you a block of land. I will give you descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. It's an interesting thing when you look at the Bible real carefully. When he said that, you you could just envision Abraham going outside and looking up at the night sky. But if you read, read carefully, you find out this conversation was happening in the middle of the day. It was like noon. So there weren't any stars in the sky. So he didn't have that image immediately, but he knew. But he said, I'll give you that many. Now, again, Sarah was barren. He was saying, how is this possible? This is what he was calling him to do. Trust in me. I'm God. I can do these things. And he does. He does now have descendants as numerous as stars of the sand because everyone since then, all the Jews in the world and the Christians are all related ancestrally to Abraham. So he did do that. He also gave him a piece of land, which happens to be what we now call the Holy Land, which happens to be fought over for the last several hundred years, which has caused about five wars in my lifetime in the Middle East. Because that's what the Jews did after World War II. They went back to that land and he said, Moses, Abraham was promised this land. We're coming to take it. The Palestinians said, we've been here for 600 years. What do you mean it's your land? So we've been fighting over that. They've been fighting over that now for decades. But it all goes back to this promise. And then he finally said, one of your descendants will bring the, re the blessing and redemption, redemption to all the nations of the world. And that was Jesus Christ. So all these promises are being fulfilled. Now, fast forward from 1850 BC to around 12 something. And this is when Israel now had been 400 years in Egypt. They were all worship Egyptian gods and they were enslaved and they need to be brought. They wanted to be freed and allowed to go back to the land that had been promised to Abraham. And so God selected Moses. And we have this second major player in the Old Testament who is Moses. And God gave Moses the law. 
the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Everything in those five books, the Jews considered the law. It has the Ten Commandments. That's the core and center. But everything in those five books, where it's God said, do this or don't do that, the Jews wrote down and memorized and tried to make everybody practice. At the time of Jesus, there were 613 rules that the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders were trying to impose on the people to live in order to obey the law. That's how expanded it got. But the law, after the promise and the covenant, is the most important thing that happened in the Old Testament. And then this covenant was expanded between God and not just Abraham, but God and all the people of Israel. Does that make sense? So that's the history that, that's gone along. Now, fast forward to Jesus. He came along and the word became man. He was the son of God, second person of Trinity. He walked on the face of the earth at a time that Israel was trying to re recover from being in the Babylonian captivity. And right after that, he established the new kingdom, which we call the church. And as it expanded in the Roman Empire, it sort of went underground because they were persecuting the Christians like crazy. Shortly thereafter, after about 313, the Edict of Milan, where the Christianity could be worshipped in the Roman Empire. People started speculating on what it was we believe. And I'm telling you this because we're looking at the creed. So we had what were called heresies. And I mentioned last week that a heretic was not somebody you burn at the stake like we did in the early part of our country. A heretic was somebody who was thinking things through and came up with an idea to explain our faith. And some of those ideas were clearly wrong and they had to be corrected. And I'll just give you an example of a few. The first heresy that came in the early church right after Jesus was ascended into heaven after year 33 was the idea that everyone who became Christian initially was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. Mary was a Jew. Joseph was a Jew. All the people around him were Jews. Everything was happening in and around Jerusalem and Galilee and Judea. And so as the new way started and people started worshiping what Christ left us, the church, these people said, if we're going to allow anybody else to become part of this community, we want them to become a Jew first. And these guys were called Judaizers. And they were going out where the evangelists were going out and inviting people to become Christian and saying, oh, but before you do, all the males have to be circumcised and you have to practice all 613 rules. You have to do kosher. You have to do everything. You have to go to Sabbath. To, you have to come to Jerusalem three times a year. You have to be a Jew. Well, here you've got 12 apostles that are going all over the world, starting churches in pagan Gentile areas. You got Paul going all over Asia, starting churches. He's converting both Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews. And he's saying, all you have to do is be baptized. And then right behind him are these guys coming up from Jerusalem and saying, I don't care what Paul said. You have to become a Jew. And they were confused. So that was the first heresy. And how it was resolved. You look in chapter, in the book of Acts, in 50 AD, the apostles got together in Jerusalem under the leadership of James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem. They prayed about it. They discussed it. They had a debate. The Judaizers presented their point. Paul and St. Peter presented their point. And they came to the conclusion that you do not have to become a Jew, become a Christian. And every man in this room is thankful for that decision. Because otherwise, we'd all be Jews. And that would have been very difficult to convert the whole world to Judaism because it was very restricted. But Christianity is very universal. So that was the first heresy that was resolved by the first council. Now, some of the other heresies came from Greek mythology. So the Greeks had all kinds of ideas about life after death and gods and all the rest of it. And their biggest one was, uh, one of their biggest ones was called dualism. There's a good God and there's a bad God. 
and they're in competition with us. So everything that happens to you that's good is because of the good God and everything that's bad is from the bad God and you're struggling in between because they're both controlling you. Uh, dualism was prevalent throughout all of the early church was fighting dualism. Uh, one of my favorites, how many of you remember, many of you, how many of you remember Y2K? Remember what happened to Y2K? Thought the world's going to come to end, right? Computers were programmed, so when the clock turned, everything would come to an end, we'd all be dead, right? That was the end of the world, Y2K. Well, believe it or not, every millennium this happened. And the first time the world was going to come to an end was right after the, the resurrection of Jesus. It was imminent. People believed the world was going to come to an end immediately. That was called monetism. And the monetists said, that's it. You know, Similar to that, when I was a child growing up in Switzerland, my dad was a diplomat. We grew up in Switzerland. I'll never forget reading one of these magazines where a bunch of survivalists in the 1950s went up on Mont Blanc, which is a big mountain in France. And they took all kinds of canned foods and waters and boats and all this stuff. And they went into a cave because the world was going to come to an end and they were going to survive. I was like 10 years old. I read about that. Scared me to death. Guess what? It didn't happen. But that was a that was a heresy. Um, again, the Manichees, two equal gods. And then one came along where people were trying to determine who was Jesus. So there's a group of, of the, there was a, he was a priest and then later bishops and almost the whole church said Jesus was fully human but he wasn't divine. He got special blessings from God, but he wasn't a divine person. And that spread throughout the church for years. Bishops believed that. And finally, a council came with the bishops of the world coming together. They resolved that and they said, no, Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Nestorian believed that Mary wasn't the Theotokos. Theotokos means Theo. God, Tokus, mother, mother of God. Mary is the mother of God. We say Mary, mother of God. Why? Because she's a mother of Jesus, the human mother of the human uh, person, Jesus. And if he's got divine person, you know, the divine person, the human, na the human nature of Jesus. And, and uh, if she was his mother and he was God, she was God's mother, not the mother of the Trinity, not the mother of God, the Father, not just that specific role. So that was another one, Nestorianism. And the apolitarianist said Jesus didn't have a human nature. So all these things came about, and there were there were councils where the where the church called the bishops of the world together, had a debate, and resolved these issues. So Jerusalem resolved that you didn't have to become a Jew. That was in 50 AD. Nicaea said Christ was the same as God and rejected Arianism. That was in 325 AD. Constantinople said the Holy Spirit is equal. All three are God. That was in 381. Ephesus, they said Mary was the Theotokos. And Chalcedon said Jesus possessed two natures, a human and a divine. Well, that's what it said, though, no human person. That, that, that's incorrect. Uh, and they rejected it. So all of these Councils came together. Now, why am I telling you all that? Because when we say the Nicene Creed, we're going to say things like light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in, with his father. Those words were all added after each of these councils to clarify that heresy so it would be clear every Sunday when we recite it that those were wrong. Does that make sense? So we took the Apostles' Creed was simple, then the heresies came along and they were refuted. And when they were refuted, the, the creed was expanded. So I think I just think it's interesting, you know, the history of these things, because you'll you'll learn it very soon. You'll be saying it almost Pavlovian style, like most of us. You just recite it, but it's tremendously important in what the words mean, how we got there, why they're there, what the church went through, and how for several hundreds of years we've believed and professed that faith. So we see the covenants, we see Abraham. The sign of the covenant was circumcision. We see Mo Moses. The sign of Moses' covenant was the law. David received a kingdom. He was the first kingdom that united the country, followed by his son Solomon. And Jesus established the kingdom of God. And that's now the sign is baptism. So we believe the church, the ecclesia, the gathering, 
the group of selected are the church is one it's one holy catholic now the word catholic i have them all capitalized because they're in a sequence but this is really a small c it's not roman catholic the word catholic means universal so we say the church is universal it's one because it came under from christ it's universal because it's open to everybody in the world and apostolic because the teachings all came from the apostles nothing has been added to the fundamental teachings since the death of john who was the last of the apostles to live he died around the year 100 so we are one holy catholic and apostolic church we have to be called roman catholicism because it's that's where the, our center was in rome versus the center in the eastern church which is constantinople and that's another political historical issue not related so i gave you this chart just so you could see how these covenants all came about the three covenants with moses and david and jesus fulfilled the three promises given to abraham and you can see on the timeline how we went from one holy couple Adam, I mean, uh, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, to one family, uh, Noah, to one tribe, Abraham, to one nation under Moses, to one kingdom under David, to one holy Catholic and apostolic church under Christ. So that's the progression. So that chart just gives you a visual of that historical expression. All right, as I mentioned, the first five books of the Bible, known as if you do Bible study, you'll hear the word Torah. That's what the Jews call the law. Pentateuch, because it's five, like Pentagon, and the word the law. So throughout the Old Testament, ever since Moses, you're going to hear those terms used. And if you know those terms, then you'll understand them when Jesus uses them in the New Testament and when the, the gospel writers use them to talk about what's going on in the New Testament. Ten Commandments, 613 rules. 248 were positive, do these things. 365 were negative, don't do these things. And 30 of them dealt with dietary laws. And they're, they're really interesting, some of the dietary laws of Judaism. Okay, here are the Ten Commandments. Now, when we get deeper into the study of the faith, we are going to look at the sacraments. We have seven sacraments. And one of the sacraments is confession, which which we uh, the priests make available to us. We'll talk about that in great detail. You will have a full understanding and awareness of it. But one of the things that helps us to to measure whether we're living in accordance with what God wants us to do or how He wants us to live is to evaluate our life in in examining it in light of the Ten Commandments. But we teach this to, you know, second graders. They have their first communion in the second grade. And they have their first confession before first communion. So we teach all that. And if you're not careful, a second grader will evaluate his conscience and say, five, five, let's see. I haven't been to confession yet. So this will be my first confession. Have I killed anyone? Uh, nope. Well, I can check that out. I've never killed anyone. So I've never violated the fifth commandment. Well, that's great on the super level. But what, what we need to do is look at subsets of that, especially for us as adults. And you're almost an adult and you're involved in the same thing. You can hurt somebody without killing them. You can hurt somebody's reputation. You can lie about somebody and destroy them. We're having we're having young people today commit suicide because of what's being said about them on the internet. Because people are saying awful things about them that aren't true, but they have no way of defending themselves. So by killing their reputation, sometimes it results in the violation of the fifth commandment. So the subsets of each of these commandments are what we are going to study. When we get ready to examine our conscience, we're going to say, have I violated these? Not in this boldest and 
broadest sense or in its base, have I violated the subsets, the components of that? And I'll give you ways to examine that because it's a beautiful thing to see how by living those 10 things that God has asked us to do and its consequences, we can really have a beautiful life. And when we violate that, we can have difficulties. And it's our free will that allows us to do that. And that's why we talk about that, particularly when we get to that sacrament. They're wonderful because the church gives us all the ways in the world to be in proper harmony and in a loving relationship with God. It's it's just really marvelous what's available to us. Okay, a definition of a person is a being with an intellect and will. How many kinds of person are there? Well, the Trinity are three persons. Each one has an intellect and a will. So when you pray, you can talk to them in prayer, individually or collectively, because you're talking to another person. Now, we don't have an image of God the Father, and we won't and we shouldn't, because he's totally spiritual. We don't have an image of the Holy Spirit, and again, we shouldn't because he's spiritual. Now, in art, there, the artists have come up with some way to give us an idea But the idea is the only person in the Trinity that we can get an image of is Jesus because he was fully human like us. You could, they recognize, he walked on the earth. We have icons. An icon is a a prayer done in art, but it's two-dimensional, not three. So that picture there of Jesus is a Greek icon, and they do, the monks do that. It's a beautiful way to pray. But that is basically an artist idea of what Jesus may have looked like. We don't know. I mean, it's 2,000 years ago. But the point is, you can pray to Jesus as a person, as you would pray to to your next door neighbor, your father, your mother, anybody else you want to pray about or to, the image in your mind is that person. And so you can do that. But you can pray to each of them because they have an intellect and will. Angels are pure spirits, but angels have intellect and will. They had the right to say no to God. That's how we think Lucifer came and created the whole demonic situation. But humans all have a body and a soul. So all of us have an intellect and will. Animals don't. Animals have, in, they have um, instinct. They live on instinct. They know by nature how to survive and how to reproduce and how to do. But they don't, like I said last week, my philosophy professor said one time, you know, you can give a dog a piece of pizza. The dog will most likely like it. The dog will associate any triangular shaped red piece of something as pizza. But he'll never know the difference between Domino's and Papa John's. You will, because you have an intellect. You can also understand abstracts, things that are beyond tangible. So this is what makes us creating the image and likeness of God. It's not our bodies. We don't look like God in our bodies. But our soul, since he is God the Father's full spirit, is in that image. And and we can communicate with them because they are persons. So you can talk to your mother and father on the phone or text or whatever you do. You can talk to God the same way. You can talk to God in prayer. God will hear you. He can respond. Now, he's not going to necessarily give you a voice. But as you get further into the prayer life, I can tell you there have been many, many instances where I was inspired through something that happened to me that caused me to believe God answered a prayer. And you you can really see in our life, we have been married 59 years. And all through our married life, we've come to crossroads where you have to go either this way or this way. We've been very blessed to be faith-filled people. And we were able to pray about those decisions. And at times, I really wanted to go this way. But in prayer, something conveyed that I should go this way. And when I look back and see where this way could have gone, (laughs) I'm thankful God directed me this way. So prayer is answered. You can talk to God. You can talk to their persons. So we're not praying some abstract. We're praying to persons. And it's really, really beautiful. And so you can... Pray to your guardian angel. Everyone is given a guardian angel at birth who's responsible for helping you get to heaven. And 
You can talk to them. I've named mine. That's okay. You don't have to. I didn't for years. But um, I'll tell you what happened. When Christendom, a school out in Front Royal, built their new chapel, magnificent. You should all go out and see it. It's absolutely one of the most beautiful churches I've ever seen. But they had bells, and they wanted donors to buy the bells to put in the tower. So we decided we would be a donor for one of the two small bells. And the bell that we are that we purchased to donate to the church, small, well, it's not small, it's about as tall as this table, but it's not one that's as big as a garbage can. Um, but it was called St. Matthias. So we we purchased the, the, the Matthias bell for Christendom. So I decided to name my guardian angel Matthias. So when I want to pray to my guardian angel, I call him Matthias. Now there is a St. Matthias, that's the other guy who's named after, but my guardian angel, I've named Matthias. It's just something I've done recently, but you don't have to do that. But it, it gives me an opportunity to envision my guardian angel as somebody I can talk to. And it's kind of cool because he's helpful. So that's how you can do that. So again, that's a person. Now, why why are we here? Why are each of us here from God's point of view? Well, he's told us that he has created us in his image and likeness in order to give glory to God. Does, does God need any one of us? Are we essential in any way? No. We only exist because God brought us into existence and we continue to exist because he sustains us in existence. He determines when we we're, were born. And unless you get outside his fear and decide to do something on your own, he will decide when we die. That's why the church says natural death. God decides when we come into the world. God decides when we leave the world. That's why things like euthanasia are morally wrong because you're taking the place of God in his decision when you should leave. So all of this will get clearer as we get further along. But God created us to give glory and show everyone else, to bring help bring everyone else to him by showing his goodness. And we're here to reflect that we're his gift. And we have an immortal so immortal, immortality, without end. Our bodies will die, our bodies will decay, but our soul will exist forever. This is what's so hard to, to, to deal with when you see the culture making man God and making success based on who has the most toys. You know, the guy that has the most money is the most successful. No. The guy that goes to heaven is the one that's successful. What's the purpose of being created? It's to be with God in the next life. He created us to love him and serve him in this life and be with him in the next life. Our whole purpose on this earth is to bring God to other people, to show them his love, to show them his magnitude, to show them his goodness. And also we're here to accept this willingness to share the happiness of God with others. That's why God created us. Why, are, why do we think we're here? From our point of view, what's, what's the purpose of us being here from our point of view? Well, it's, it's, it's to accept his love, even though we don't understand fully what it is. And love is an interesting concept. We'll talk about that just in a second. Um, we're also here to grow in happiness despite the fact that you will never be fully happy on this earth. Happiness is fulfilled in the next life. Now, it's really hard for us as humans to think of anything beyond this. We don't know of anything beyond this. All of our experience is experience in our bodies, in our life, in our existence. It's very hard to conceive of what it might be like in heaven. But that's what hope is for. That's what the virtue of hope is for. You're hoping for something that you expect to be there. And it will be there because you have faith and believe in it. But that's what we're trying to do is grow in, grow in happiness, even though we'll never fulfill it and, and achieve our final end, end. Another word for heaven, 
which you hear often is called the beatific vision. <clears throat> to see the face of God. A dear friend of ours was a priest, knew him years and years and years, Father Pilon. And I want you to think about this for a second. Another priest friend of his, a week or so before he died, with him knowing he was going to die, asked him, Father, what is it? What's the first thing you hope to see if on your death you get to go to heaven? What do you think he said? What had he done his entire life as a priest every day? He raised the host after pro professing the words consecration. And he, behold, the Lamb of God, this is, he, he brought Jesus to us in communion, but all he could see was a host. All he could see was the axe. He couldn't see the face of Jesus. And he turned to his priest friend and said, my first hope is to see face of Jesus. I thought that's really what we all need to think about. First thing you want to see if you wake up in heaven is the face of Jesus. And he won't look like a host. He won't be a piece of bread anymore. He will be that person that we've learned to love. And I love the, 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 the image. Beverly and I, like I said, we've been married uh, 50, 59 years. We dated about two years. We met. She knew she was going to marry me. It took me two years to figure it out. But anyway, we dated. Um, we were apart. We wrote letters. We came back together. We dated. We got engaged. Then we went through the engagement. We got, and then, then we got married. I spent a lot of time when we were dating, trying to get to know her. I couldn't wait to get off work to go and spend time. And we didn't do anything spectacular. In, in Junction City, Kansas, Fort Valley, Kansas, there wasn't any place to go. There was no razzle dazzle place, so we would go and 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 sit some. There were there were two dams being built on this one river to, to make this huge lake, and you drive to, to to look at the dam. I mean, it was a big deal. It's parked in front of a big dam, but I wasn't parked in front of the dam because I like to look at the dam. I was parked in front of that so I could talk to Beverly and find out what are her likes, what are her dislikes. What was her childhood like? Where did she grow up? What what her parents do? What what's her favorite color? What's her favorite food? What what does she want me to do? What I, we just couldn't get enough of each other. Just talking. It didn't have to be elaborate. It didn't have to be a, go to a movie or go out to dinner. It could just be sitting in a car or sitting in a room and talking and learning about each other. And we did that on and off in certain ways for two years. Then we got married. Then we spent fifty nine. Continuing to figure out who we are. We still haven't got it all squared away. She still surprises. But my point here is you can go through life and give lip service to this idea of God. What do you want to do when one of that? I want to go to heaven. Well, what, what's in heaven? Oh, well, well, God. Well, do you know him? Uh, no. Do you ever talk to him? Well, Sunday, I say the Lord's Prayer. But do you talk to him? Do you know him? Do you want to know about him? Do you want to be with him? You can't expect to suddenly die and then get to heaven. People go through all their life saying, I'm too busy. I'll do that when I'm older. Uh, I have invented my own bumper sticker. Those people who plan to be saved at the 11th hour often die at 1030. So you don't necessarily, you don't have a guarantee that you're going to get the, the last minute conversion. You got to spend your life trying to get to know Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, because that's who you're going to spend eternity with. If it took me two years to get to know Beverly well enough to be married, think of how much you need to know God to spend eternity with. You've got to want to know him. You want to love him. You want him to love you. You want to know what makes him happy. You don't want to make him unhappy. He's a person. And that's what this is all about. That's why this first part is dealing on this philosophy. The ultimate end is to get to heaven. So we got to spend this time and I've had 83 years to work at. You may have even more because lifespans are getting longer. Don't waste time on, on earthly things. You got to do your work. You got to do your business. You got to make money. Yeah, that's all there. But don't 
ignore God when you want to spend eternity with him. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm almost done. What must I do to attain heaven? Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Two commandments Jesus said are the most important. Now, John added another little quiver in there, another little twist that makes it even harder. Because John said you're supposed to love your neighbor as Jesus loves you. And if you know how much Jesus loves you, he gave his life for you. So technically, we're called to love our neighbor, who is all the people we interact with, particularly people we're closest to, in that way. It's it's a goal. It's an objective. It's place. But you can love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, here's a definition of love that a priest gave us a few years ago that's wonderful. Love is something that is based on knowledge. That's what I just told you. You don't, you don't, people don't go down the street and say, oh, I like the way that girl looks. I think I'll marry her. Will you marry me? Oh, sure, I'll marry you. We'll go off and get married. We don't know each. No, no. You marry after you get to know somebody. So love is based on knowledge. Also, it's a decision of the will. It's not a feeling. You don't fall in love and you don't fall out of love. You choose to love. And in 59 years, I can tell you there are many days that I was not Prince Charming. And Beverly was not happy with me. In fact, she probably didn't like me on many days. But she always chose to love me because it's a decision of the will. You will to love a person. You can have your ups and downs. Also, marriage is not 50-50. It's not a bargain. Um, you make breakfast, I'll take the trash out. Oh, you're burnt to toast. Uh, I'm not going to move the trash. No, it's a 100% gift of the man to the woman. And the woman's a 100% gift to the man. You're giving your complete self to the other, and love is looking out for the good of the other. It's also permanent. That's why marriage is permanent. You love someone till one of you dies. And it open to life, not necessarily meaning only to children. Some people can't have children. But open to life means you're open to God, what he's bringing into your life. That's a wonderful definition of love. Also, you're obliged to learn to love God. You're called to do things for him. We we do things for the people we love. I do things for Beverly all the time. She does things for me all the time. Not because she wants to do them for me, but because she loves me and vice versa. And we also need to be open to the gifts that come from God, supernatural gifts and grace. Who will tell us about this? Jesus. He calls us to love and serve God in this life. And he was sent to show us the way. We'll learn more about how he died for us and what he created in the church. Finally, um, purpose of man's existence is the church was left under the Holy Spirit to give us the divine revelation, which we talked about last week. Divine revelation is the sacred scripture and the sacred traditions that were not written down in the scripture that came to us from the apostles. We call that sacred tradition. Private revelations, things about Mary and uh, the visions of Mary and things that different people have left are private. You do not have to believe those. You can if the church identifies them being true, but you don't have to. All you have to believe in is the public revelation which is the divine scripture, sacred Christian, sacred tradition. Uh, you can also use a catechism as the source to study the deposit of faith. So that's as far as I plan to go. And does anyone have any question? Yes, wonderful. Yes, sir. So does, um, we'll go about what you just said. So does that mean that we don't have to, quote unquote, investigate or believe certain Eucharistic miracles? Uh, the, the, it depends on whether the Eucharistic miracle came about to a, a, a person who said, I believe this happened. Many of the things the church teaches, um, and once the church teaches, it's all right. But you don't have to accept mainly the Marian dogmas that, you know, there, there are people, Lourdes, for instance, or um, going to one of the holy places. The, the church has accepted that there was a miraculous thing that happened at Lourdes. The church accepts that that little girl did meet the Blessed Mother. But we're not obliged to believe that in the same way we're obliged to believe what Matthew said about Jesus. You can believe it. You can go to Lord's. You can receive 
blessings from it. But that's considered a private revelation. And any of the miracles they described as private revel, regal, revelations, you can believe if the church has authenticated them, but you don't have to. Well, we have to believe the scriptures. And I'll give you an example. Medjugorje is a very holy place, and it's been very popular for pilgrimages. But the church hasn't even decreed yet that that's an official church-sanctioned belief. It may, just like Lord's, but it hasn't. So it's very possible, but it's not required. So every Catholic doesn't have to believe if they go to Medjugorje, they'll get something. Or even Lord's, or even Guadalupe, or any of those, because they're private revelations. That's, that's a distinction. But thank you for, for the question. Anybody else? Okay. Next week, please read chapter two. We're going to get in more theology. How in the world did we come up with the attributes of God? I mean, who gave us those? It's kind of interesting the way we found that. But this is um, this is what we'll go through chapter by chapter. Um, I ask you to call me on the phone, email me, ask a question in class, ask a question before class, ask a question after class. Whatever I can do to answer your questions is more important than me giving a lecture. But I've proven in two weeks that I can do it, and I'll fill up the hour, and I've got slides to do it. So if you don't ask, <laughs> I can do it fast or I can do it slow. So if you ask questions and we talk about that for 10 minutes, I'll still get the material to you. So please, that's what it's for. All right, we'll end with the blessed Mother's Prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. And I will see you next Monday night.